give me that thing. Hey guys, Dave Ray here. You're watching Graveyard Cars. This time on Graveyard Cars, Alyssa and Dave get cracking on the assembly of Box 1971 Challenger RT. Oh, okay, so they're pre-bent. Yep, you can keep tell. going. But when they hit a potentially dangerous roadblock, Alyssa takes matters into her own hands. Hey Mike, what are you working on? Making sure the engine and suspension are ready for installation. What have you done? <laughs> Mark fills us in on the reasons for Bondo's bad reputation, cutting down the myths that all filler is a bad thing. This is a textbook example exactly why filler has a bad name. Even with Alyssa taking charge, will the team be able to rally to get the 71 Green Go Challenger on its own four wheels? Ah! Find out on this episode of Graveyard Cars. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that the Cranberry dead are coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman, and together we bring dead muscle cars back to life, to exactly the way they were on the day they were born. In case you passed out from the G-Force in your new demon, here's what happened last time. The team finished Bruce Gibson's burnt orange 1970 446 barrel Cuda. Will laid out the very difficult and highly translucent FK5 paint. Mark perfectly placed the iconic hockey stick stripe and the ghouls took care of the rest, assembling the hood, deck lid, trim, and rocker moldings. Unlike most cars at GYC, this was a body and paint only job. Stunning that, <laughs> that paint job on there. Bruce will be finishing the rest of the car at home and hopefully showing it off to us as soon as he's finished. Uh, we're working on a 1971 Dodge Challenger RT in this beautiful green go paint. Uh, I just got it back from Will here not so long ago. So we finally got it off the whirly jig. It's up on the bend pack and uh, ready to start putting some parts on it. Yeah, I kind of bring this one up under here and hook it into my tab here where my flux line's gonna go. I could just kind of feel it. Once that goes in there, I know I'm good there. This has a place to run the stud and a place for the pin to go through. I mean, this is like the hub. This is like the, the heart of the system here. Really cool, really important piece. Got to make sure it's brand new. Never use used brake parts. Make sure you always replace your brake parts. Uh, this here's my firewall brake line. This end right here, you can kind of see it's it's got a specific shape. It wants to follow the contour of the firewall, of course. Uh, all these little clips here, like this one here, this one, and this one, all control where this thing mounts to the firewall. So this being a 1971 through there. So we got to make sure you got the right brake line for the right year car you're doing. And it pays, like I said, to save your old brake lines, just so you know, you can make sure. But these guys at Inline Tube are awesome because they do a fantastic job with these brake lines. You can kind of see just laying the thing up here, how it, it pretty well follows the right shape, you know, of where it needs to go. Yeah, I got all the firewall lines done. Uh, I got my proportioning valve in. The lines uh, are ready for the master cylinder. Uh, these guys at Inline Tube are awesome. They kind of put marks right here with tape on there. It says straighten, and usually there's two, but one came off. But it'll say like straighten between the two things here so you know exactly where you got to straighten it out so you don't end up with a totally tweaked out brake line. Dave, wait. Hey, don't hey. Don't start without me, I'm here. What's up, you I'm made here, it, huh? don't start without me. Did you get all your human resource stuff taken care of? I did, did yes. That right. had me busy. Well, cool. Okay. Now, what I'm gonna do is, you haven't done any of these yet, have you? No. Okay, these aren't too bad. I'm really excited to work on this car. I've already met with Buck and learned the history on it, so it's great to be able to come out here and help Dave get it started. I already did some of the front ones, but these are the frame rail ones. Okay. This line right here is gonna go right down the, the frame and hook to that. It's gotta go through here, so go all the way down. Keep going and then go down, like right under here like that. Oh, okay, so they're pre-bent. Yep, you can keep tell. going. Okay, because what I gotta do is I gotta feed everything through this hole. 
Well, we got our frame line kind of mocked into place, our brake line. Okay. Uh, so I got it screwed into the proportioning valve where it's supposed to go. So now there's a bunch of little clips and fasteners I got to go along. And you can see here I got brake line clip for E-body, 70 to 74. So these are what they give you. Uh, we got some actual screw-in clips like that, as you can see, and then these ones right here snap in like that. And then that part would snap into the frame rail. See how that holds that in there? So that's kind of primarily the way that clip there works. Yeah, it was really great helping Dave and getting to see the car before everything else comes in. Pretty easy, everything went in like it was supposed to. It was the first time that nothing fought with us really and it went yeah. as planned, so that was nice. Okay, so that's all basically right. our, our frame brake lines. That wasn't too bad. No, that didn't fight us at all. Yeah, that just try to figure it with all the other components in there trying to get it in. That's why we do it now. It's really yeah, I can easier. see that. So does all this right. one go on the same exact way as the first one? Yeah, this one right here is basically the same, same setup we did before. Uh, that one, there's the brake line runs there. This is actually a vapor line, a 5 16 vapor return line, like for the fuel system. But this one here, if you kind of look here, see this hole in the trunk? Yeah. This is where the vapor ventilation system is mounted on the 71 Challenger. So mm -hmm. this line will actually come down the frame rail and point that way, and then it'll hook into that. Just watch the car there. There you go. All right, now I'm going to go through this hole, and it's got to sit kind of like this. So. Yeah, and this one here will go on the same way. It'll have clips and it'll have screws. But the thing is, is that it piggybacks the fuel line and you actually clamp them both at the same time with a fatter clamp. Oh, but we'll okay. put a couple clips to kind of just hold it into place. For now, let me get this sticker off here. Yeah. So that'll basically take care of that. So a lot of our under the car stuff is done. So we'll go through the assembly room checklist. Some of the stuff's questionable, but uh, yep, for Helping nice. me out with that for a little bit? Sure, yeah. Cool, all right. Well, whenever a car comes in here for assembly, of course, we get it up here on the bin pack, take it off the whirly jig. Then all those parts are brought in for that specific car and put on the assembly room shelves. And these are basically my shelves. I utilize this whole area underneath the workbench on top of the workbench. So these are all the parts that came off of the car. Okay. Some cars hardly have anything on the shelves because there wasn't much of the car that we got to begin with. Like the Phantom Cuda basically had nothing but a steering wheel, I think <laughs> yeah. is all we had on that car. So this is nice seeing it loaded down with parts so we know we're at a good starting point. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I devised this list. I thought of every part from bumper to bumper on the car oh my that goodness. goes on the car. And my amazing wife typed all this up for me and it looks beautiful. Aww. So it was nice of her to do that That was for really me. nice of her. Yeah. After Alyssa helps Dave go through the checklist, Dave gets prepped to install the very cool, very unique 71 Challenger RT headliner. Okay, right now on a Buck 71 Challenger, I'm working on the uh, overhead consulate and formed headliner. So if you want to go ahead and like get in the car, you can come around that other side and I'll actually hand it to you. And then we'll okay. just kind of feed it back and then I'll get in on the other side. So it's just not too So am bad. I okay to just get in? Yeah. It yeah, has, it's on dollies. It's so. not going to like tip either way? No, it's not going to tip. Why don't we have wheels on it yet? Eh, because your dad's lagging. No. <laughs> this is kind of a first. Usually, oh, ooh, you know. Not feel. Here, grab that end of it. Yeah, there. usually it has wheels on it. Yeah, they're they're slow on the suspension, so I'm ahead of the game. Ah. Just, if you could just let it sit, right, like that. Oh, okay. And let me get in over here. Yep. Yeah, this is the first overhead console formed headliner I've ever worked with. You know, I've seen them in car shows and stuff like that. Never had the pleasure of working on one. Uh, so this is something new and, and fresh, and it's a lot of fun to work on it. Let me get up in here. I'll just hang out. I know, it's kind of a pain, huh? See, that's why I wanted your help, see? Yeah, I can see where it'd be a lot easier. Kind of a pain in the butt. I think the overhead console is really cool. Uh, I love the formed headliner. I mean, everybody knows that uh, the old bow style headliners, they all fall down, they sag and everything else. So this overhead console with the formed headliner is really cool because it fits nice and tight and you got those cool, you know, little headliner up there with an extra, you know, different dome light, you know, set up in it. And then you got your seatbelt light, your low fuel light, your door jar light, just makes it kind of cool and a little more modern, a little more classy. I'm impressed with how good of condition it's still in. The fact that it's still original is pretty awesome. Now, if you look there, see your seatbelt bolt? Mm-hmm. Go ahead and grab that. Okay. And it's going to go in this big hole on the side. So I'll keep it from falling on our heads. We'll have to take those back out to actually put the seatbelts in. But the nice part is, 
See, it almost stays up there by itself, yeah. which is kind of cool. Sweet, that's it? Cool. Yeah, that's wow. it. Yeah, basically right now, I'll put the rear view mirror in to kind of hold the front, but it's just kind of hard to hold it with your head and, yeah. and get the two bolts in the side, so. Okay, yeah, cool. That helps out. Yeah, and then I just got to get Larry up here to do the vinyl top. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> kind of sketchy or whatever, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go talk to my dad about getting the engine done because this thing on the skateboard thing is really sketchy. <laughs> it is. It's terrible. Every time you jump in it, it moves. So you got to be yeah. kind of careful. But it's nice to have them so then I can actually get some stuff done on the car. So, so for once, I'm way ahead of the game on this one. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good though. It makes me look good. As long as I'm waiting on them, I'm doing all right. So, right, you yeah, are, I'm yeah. Hey, why do you have that car on a skateboard? You want to repaint it? The nice thing about being an apprentice is that I have the ability to jump from each department and kind of be wherever they need me. So if Dave has worries or concerns or there's something out there that needs to be addressed to my dad, then it's nice that I'm able to come up and talk to him and kind of bounce around wherever they need me. What car are you talking about? The green Challenger. Okay, what car? The Challenger. Oh, okay. You know, if that's what you want to rename it, that's fine. Is it a Challenger? What car are you talking about? The green one that Dave's working on. He'll always go for that one question that he knows is going to make me look stupid because I don't know the answer. And then I get upset, and then I get confused by why I ever even came into his office, and then I leave with no answers. So it's just a game. Because I'm usually out trying to explain to my daughter, who should know by now, what kind of car is in the shop. This is what's going to happen. Dave or I are going to crawl hey. in that car, and it's going to roll back and hit the bin pack, and we're going to have to. OK, I would, That's what's I would recommend that what putting some chains around the base of it to keep it from rolling around. That's what I would recommend. So like around the wheels? Yeah, and that will keep it from moving around. And okay. and in the meantime, if you guys just really tell me that you're ready for that, it would help me to know that, because I could probably put enough together on it that you could get the suspension underneath it. Where have you been? Well, I've been out there in the shop with Why? agents together. Why is it underneath the bin bag? crazy looking Nadine. I hate you, whatever, Dad. Okay, well, if anything happens to it, it's your fault. It's nice not hair. Dave or mine. Wait. Do you not like my hair? Nadine Cross, man. It's blonde. It's No, it's not. It's that gray. It's that post-sex <sighs> with the devil gray. Uh, I think Alyssa is not necessarily trying to take more charge. I just think that that's what happens when you're out there and you're under the gun and you're trying to get things done. And if along the way you can take a shot at the old man, you know, take it, right? It's clear. Take the shot. Sorry. <laughs> Nadine Cross. Dude, Are you serious? Do like this. Just look off to the. This is not. Right, Push your lips together. Not, no, no. I don't appreciate it, honestly. Hey, Mike. What are you working on? Uh, Bucks Challenger 383. Perfect. I was actually just going to come and ask you about this. Good. So, is this the last thing to hook up? Yeah, let's do this. We'll take it outside and fill it up with water, and then we should be able to run it. Nice. Okay. Cool. All I right. think we're ready to start it up. Let's do this. We don't need yeah. to get my dad. We got this. You yeah. built it. All right, we'll spill it up with water, then maybe we'll go get him just to be here while we start it. Why? Well, because if something goes wrong, at least he'll be out of here. How great would it be, though, if we go out there, fire it up, get it started, and then go in and tell my dad that we finished? Oh, um, I'll just tell him you said it's okay. That's fine. Okay. I mean, you're used to being Do in trouble with this? him, right? Pretty much, yeah. Mike, there's no tomorrow. <laughs> we got to get this started today. Well, that can be your argument. Exactly. Dad, there is like no my dad tomorrow. always says, there's no tomorrow. Once Buck's 383 engine is locked in and fired up on the run stand, it's ready to be married to the K member and installed in the Challenger. All right, I'm All excited right. to start this thing. All right, I think we're ready. Okay, so what do I do? All right, so turn power on. The other way. Okay. okay. So you know when it comes on because the lights are on. Okay. And turn all these on. So as long as the green lights are on, that means we have a fan, fuel pump, coil power, and then that's the starter button. <laughs> hey, Son hey. of a What's up, boss? Yeah. No, no. See that? Ain't nothing getting by the kid. Nothing. Why are nothing you Nothing at all. Nothing gets ran without the whole well, we just We no. were just coming to get you. Go ahead. No, you weren't coming go ahead, to get Go me. ahead. I am sitting in there filling out parcels. And I get you the You have to run like 10 feet. 150 feet, and I zigzagged in and out of about 15 cars. There's 15 cars in? Yeah. Oh, anyway, just started, would you? I said, no. Okay. Sit there, in a parse. You need some it. oxygen? I smells it, right? Dissension. Okay. Stink. Are you serious, Stink Dad? Stink oh, I did. I knew something was going on. I peeked out there. I thought, well, maybe Dave's getting ready Wait. to drive. 
a car, right? You were spying Without on Without my us? approval. Why are you doing this? Why wasn't this done I, before? I thought we wanted to put this engine in the car. We did. Okay. Did you want to run it first? Yeah, we always okay. run it. Well, then run it. But it, but it was already on the stand. It's transmission. I thought. Right. So that we could store it. And then it was time to run it. I took it off. Actually, me and you both took it off, if you remember. At your age, you probably don't remember very much, but do you remember yeah. it all working on it? No. You don't? I haven't touched this engine. Huh. What are you doing? Are you getting ready to fire it up? Right. I wanted okay, to. Okay, so you wanted what it to catch doing? on fire? Yeah, I was hoping it would. You can pour gas on top of it and burn it if you want. That's why I was hoping we could do it. Until you grabbed it, it was out of the way. This is why you got to have the old man come out. Okay. Oh, my God. This is why Colonel Jessup has to come out. Here we go. Voodoo. Let me know when you're ready. Voodoo. Zahoodoo. Anyway, can we just start this thing so I can get back to work? I thought you needed this drivetrain in that car because it was down on the dolly. Oh. oh, that's why it's out here. You want, you want the master to do it? Yeah, yeah, please. Please, master. <laughs> but Big Daddy, is that what you call yourself, Big Daddy? Please don't. Double check you didn't do a, a Darren Black Ball on me where you disconnect the wire. No, there's no wire. Clink, clink, clow. Can't understand you. All right, now it's rid of this. OK, truck. go ahead, Big Daddy. What have you done? <laughs> what happened, Dad? Rupert's ruined it. If I could I do your laugh, that now would be the time I do it. What is it? How did I, how did I ruin it? What did I do what to ruin it? What is it? You dumb <laughs> got the wrong size flywheel. You put it on there. No, I didn't, you crazy <laughs> That, when I walked in, you had the bell housing, the flywheel, which only has four bolts in it, so I know you did it, and the starter on it. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Oh, You're right. I don't know what I was All thinking. All right, Joe, you put it on. Man, I'm crazy. I must need a So you doctor. don't remember saying, run upstairs and grab a flywheel? Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, and I walked outside and I came back. I went up front to save the world. I came out and you had it on the engine stand. That's all I know. Well, it's because now yesterday you said I did nothing all day and you had to put it on the engine stand. So what is it? You hear that noise? Yeah. That's, that's a 10 and a half inch flywheel. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you, I think why did you put the 11 inch I don't on think there? it's a 10 and a half inch flywheel. OK. Because that's a 10 and a half inch bell housing. All okay. aluminum bell housings are 10 and a half inch. Okay. So I think that must be a smaller one, perhaps out of something else. Okay. Although the wrong I don't one. know when the last time Mopar made a, a, that small of a flywheel. Something's weird. I know something's weird. Something strange. There's something Dad. strange in the 383. Who you gonna call? Ice Man. <laughs> You're the one that did it. Oh my God. So right now, my dad's trying to figure out if he put on the wrong size flywheel on Buck's engine. So he's comparing it to this engine to see. We either got the wrong flywheel or we got... That's all it can be, because there's only one starter, right? Well, I didn't say the wrong starter. I said we either got the wrong flywheel. We probably got the wrong flywheel. Well, We're going to take this thing. Let's roll it back in there and take it off. Just take the bell housing off of it. Uh, we got the flywheel out, and uh, it's the right one. It's the 10 and a half that goes with the aluminum bell housing. But looking at it, the starter's a little bit cocked out, like to the outside, which would mean that the teeth wouldn't engage with the, with the ring gear on the flywheel, basically. But I, it's weird because it either goes in there or it doesn't go in there. If it goes in there, it shouldn't be cocked off to one side. So we're just taking the starter back out again to see if we can figure out what it is. But again, good reasons for me to come out here because these crazy guys, they just set fire to it and started peeing on the ashes and all kinds of stuff. I'm, I'm the level-headed guy, you know, I'm the ice pick, the ice tray, the ice cube, the ice man. That looks perfect now. Okay, so you just had a, the top bolt was cross threaded for one. You probably started oh. with a ratchet instead of starting by hand. I started by hand, I always You couldn't do. have. You could, yeah. Oh. Actually, I ran it all the way in and all the way out. It's not cross threaded. It was. It isn't. It was. <laughs> Where'd you leave off with? It was? Yeah. It wasn't. Okay. We can do that all day if you want to. Okay. You know, I can come over to your house later tonight. We'll have some beers and pizza and keep doing it. Come until on one down. of us falls asleep. What but it you wasn't your crossfit. Age. I ran it all the way in, all the way out. Where's okay. the bolt at? So now all of a sudden it's uncross threaded and it miraculously has solved its own problems. Where's the other bolt at? See, the cross threaded is not. You don't take it back out and then just put it back in. That's an aluminum bell housing over a steel bolt, grade eight bolt. The bolt would have chased new threads in it. Okay. I believe you, Mike. Was it, was it straight in there now or not? Yeah, it looks really good. You're doing a great job. Between you and me, that A little bit earlier, I was talking to Josh about the filler on the 69 Dodge Charger. I just wanted to take a minute or two to dispel a terrible myth 
that's out there. And that is the word Bondo. So Bondo is bad. We take a picture of this, we put it on Facebook. I was teasing him about that. And you're gonna have 100 keyboard commandos coming in and talking about how Bondo is butchering a car. First of all, Bondo is a trade name. That's the actual name, a proper name of the plastic filler used many years ago and still probably made today. What we put on the car is a plastic filler, all right? It's a, just imagine it's a really, really thick primer, okay? If it's used right, in this case, this is right. How we do it at Graveyard Cars is right. How many shops do it in the collision world is right. They're, it got its bad name from doing it wrong. The right way, start with fresh bare metal, grind it down to the metal, Put an epoxy sealer, we use DP90, it's a, a catalyzed epoxy sealer. Put your filler over the top of it. Don't have your filler too thick, but in this particular case, if you look, you can see the metal poking through in areas. That's how thin it is. But that slim, slick, non-millage coat is actually making this panel really, really flat. Over the top of that, we're gonna put a catalyzed urethane primer. Now that filler, that plastic filler, some people call Bondo, we use a 3M product. That filler is gonna be sandwiched between two catalyzed products. Moisture will never cause it to swell, never cause it to shrink, never cause it to rust, never cause it to do anything. So filler, when done right, is perfectly fine. The factory used filler, that's the fact. Even today, the factory uses filler because it's a perfectly good product if it's done right. I wanna take you out back and show you what happens when you don't use it right. When you butcher a car like so many times people are accused of doing. This is gonna be a really educational moment for you to be able to see how not to use plastic filler. These chargers are the ones that we drug in from Seattle a while back or, or close to Seattle. Been setting in that field forever and ever. This car goes out, it's a 68 charger, probably original 318 car. Gets crashed into a pole, this fender's caved in. The body man or whatever he was, used car recon guy, drills these holes in the fender. That's what you see these right here. They put a slide hammer in there. They work that slide hammer and they pull that dent out. They get it as far as they think they can get it and then they just smear mud over it, Bondo, filler plastic. And this is what you end up with. This is how filler got a bad rap is because I don't want any Bondo in my car. Well, it's plastic filler, but okay, you don't want any in your car. Why? Because it cracks out. It does crack out if you don't do it right. If you put it on too thick and you don't prep the surface right, if you have holes underneath it that water can get through the back side. This is a great example. So here we are 30 years later. Give me an example. There's a chunk of the filler. If you look at the back side of it, you see it's rusty. This was ready to let go too. This is decayed faster than the areas where it still had decent adhesion to the metal. But this was the rust that was starting to form that was causing this filler to come off. That's what the fender looked like when the body man was done straightening it out. This should have never had filler put over the top of it. One, the fender should have either been replaced, probably would have been the best thing, or at least repaired right. But at the very least, one thing a body man could have done if they would have took the time was to cut this section off, put it upside down on, on like a, a flat area where you can beat the back side of it out, shape it right, put it back on and weld it up. But instead, they kind of got it roughed out and they just smeared plastic filler over it. They, over these holes, imagine these holes are exposed to the elements on the back side. Every time it rains, water goes up. Well, this stuff absorbs, it's just plastic. It'll absorb water and when it does, it swells. Then it begins to form rust on the bottom of it. And then at the end of it all, that's what you have. This is a textbook example exactly why filler has a bad name. You look at our charger in there, it's clean, it's done right. It was bare metal to start with. It was shiny bare metal with a good sanding and a good bite to it. Then it got epoxy, then it got filler, and then it gets urethane over the top of that. It's perfect, it's sealed right, and it'll last forever. That's what you don't do right there. So we, all that was wrong was we had the flywheel. All that was wrong was the fly, what are you doing? Are you trying to start it? Well, we were gonna start it. Well, you bat. Well, we we, I'm giving an OTF. Can we start it when the cameras are on? It's kind of funny that when things go wrong here, my dad's the first one to place blame, and then he wants people to take responsibility for it. But as soon as it's on him, all of a sudden, it's, it doesn't matter. Oh, 
So I think that's kind of funny. Okay, are we ready? You got all three on, engaged. You turn the fan off for now so you don't run the battery dead. The flywheel's turning. No, the battery's dead. Okay. And Beautiful. the battery's dead. Beautiful oh. day in the neighborhood. So definitely not the climax I was hoping for. Thought we'd come out here, turn it off, and boom, fire it right up. And that is definitely not how this is going. Um, I think the number one factor is probably my dad. He's contributed to this problem, honestly. Um, I'm not sure what happened. At first we thought it was the flywheel, and then we thought it was a starter, and now I'm not sure where we're at with it, to be honest. But all I know is that those are the parts that my dad put in. So super glad he signed off on those, because it did us a lot of good. We took off the distributor cap to find out that the points had slid shut on it, and that's why we weren't getting any spark. So we took a break, we charged the battery up, we made sure we brought the uh, crankshaft up top dead center, made sure that it was pointing the right place. So I think we're ready to try it again. You guys ready to try it again? I'm yes. ready to feel comfortable. Let's do this, I hope Let's so. Let's do this, mother blanker. All right. All right. Oh. You know how to do it, remember? Okay. Key goes on. Go ahead. For me, one of the biggest payoffs in these builds is firing up that engine for the first time on the run stand. Uh, you got the smells, you, all your senses are on overload. I mean, you've got the vibration. You can actually feel that engine firing on every cylinder. And normally, I actually even love the sound of it, except when the technician is taking it upon himself to leave the right-hand muffler off. So the engine sounds great. Mike made sure that everything was good with the engine, so we're able to get it in the car now. I feel like I can take credit for this one. Um, I'm the one that kind of got the ball rolling and let everybody know that this needed to be first priority. So, yeah, take credit. This is the part when the engine's running that you're okay to start dancing. I showed you some of that. So you want to kind of get it going with the clap. This is the part where you dance. You get it going with the clap and you get a little bit of rhythm. And then you start, kind of just move your hand out like that. And then get the same thing going over here, like that. And that's the right and the left, like that. My dad likes to dance a lot in general. I'm not sure exactly what beat he's dancing to. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense. I wish he wouldn't do it. Yeah, it was awesome getting to be a part of firing up the engine. I mean, of course, I was going to make sure I wasn't left out of this one, but it was awesome getting to be out there and actually getting to be right next to the engine when you fire it up. Usually it's in a car. So that was really unreal to be right there with it. It sounded great. I'll get some cool on here and drop it off with you. All right, thanks Mike. Yep, thank you. Dave and Alyssa prepped Buck 71 Challenger RT for the drivetrain, installing the brake and fuel lines. In addition, they knocked out the headliner, the overhead consulate, and the dash. Okay. Hey. Right. Ready to go? Yeah. Okay, so this here, we got to get through this hole right here. Okay. So it's not going to fit perfectly right in there, so I have to kind of twist it. So a little finagling, and we will get it. So if you want to grab that side there, just watch these are sharp. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, when Alyssa first came back to Graveyard Cars, it was right about the time we moved into our new shop, and I think she was a little bit bewildered, I guess you might say. But watching her, you know, power this car through the shop and gathering up the guys and kind of making sure that we're meeting our deadlines and that we're doing things the way they're supposed to be doing, is it's a mini-me, really. Uh, so, you know, as a father, I'm certainly proud. As a shop owner, I'm really glad. I can see one day turning the reins over, possibly to her, and letting her carry on the torch. Yeah, you got the ball rolling in the engine room, and it sounds like we're going to be getting our suspension here very shortly, so. Ready? Yeah. Home run. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ready to put uh, the shifter in here, our automatic shifter in the 71 Dodge Challenger RT. Still waiting on suspension, uh, so I'm just trying to get as many things done as I can. Uh, I got some of my glass put in, got regulators, some stuff in. I just still need to drop in my, my door glass. Always difficult, you know, when it's in a position like this. So uh, this is what, you know, I got to work on today. So just a few screws and a couple bolts and a spring. So this little deal right here, I kind of left it all together. It just makes it a little bit easier. This will drop right on down into the, the hole here. And that there will kind of screw on the side of your hump there. 
and you kind of see it just drops right into place. And this will be just kind of mocked into place. I'm not just like installing this for good. It's not like it's gonna move the car right now, but just any, any little thing I can get to be ahead of the game makes it a little bit easier, so. So this here being a slapstick, you know, I don't know if, you know, a lot of people knew, you know, back in the day, I know a lot of racers did, but uh, the reason they call it a slapstick is whenever you drop it in a low like that, every gear you go up, you just hit it. It only goes one gear at a time. So there you go in a second, slap it in the drive again. So you can concentrate on where you're going and just hit that thing as hard as you can. Then it stops in drive and it won't go into neutral. So to get it in neutral, you got to go and push your button again to get it to go into neutral or push in your button to get it to go down into low again. Right now, Mike and I are just wrapping up the uh, exterior dressing of the 383 Magnum that goes in our 1971 Challenger. This is the FJ6 uh, Green Go car. Yeah. We had everything rebuilt. The engine's been done. It's already been ran on the engine run stand. It's kind of interesting because this is such a an amazing amount of stuff that goes on an air conditioning car. Usually when you see our engines, you've just got the intake manifold, the valve cover sh staring at you, a nice air cleaner. You got the pulleys and, the, and stuff in the front. But with this, you've got this monstrous setup on the top. I mean, look at the size of that AC compressor. Look at the belts that route out around the alternator, down around the crankshaft. This is quite a setup for back in the day. This is the exact routing of the belts as it was intended when the car was new. And the exact brackets and bracket tree that goes with it that was originally designed by the manufacturer. So we're getting to a point where we just have heater hoses, choke stove we have to put on, uh, we have our breather that we need to put on, and our high pressure and low pressure power steering hoses. At that point, the engine will be ready to put into the car. Once we do that, we can get the car down. With all this being built out, it's ready to go in. <clears throat> the rest of the car is also ready to be built out. And that brings us over to the massive, massive air conditioning sub pieces that go inside the car. That's what we're looking at right now. So Classic Auto Air, uh, they're the company that we sublet all of our air conditioning stuff to. We send it out, it looks terrible. It's old, it's rusty, it's crusty, nothing's plated like it's supposed to be. Everything is in dire straits that comes back to us and here's a completely restored, you could call it a suitcase or a heater box, whatever you want. Everything, including right down to the firewall installation pad, comes back with this. This is a multiple, multiple component piece. And what's nice about this is we didn't have to do it. Meaning, could we fumble our way through it? Of course we could. Would it take us 10 times longer than the people that do it every single day? Yes, it would. So it's nice that everything is here, it's laid out, it's marked, it's inventoried, and now we can just go over to the car. Another interesting thing about these uh, factory air conditioning, H51 is the alphanumeric code that you would see on the fender tag or in the broadcast sheet. Chrysler was selective in some cases for obvious reasons, and in other cases not so obvious reasons as to where they would put their air conditioning. So for example, 340 available both with a four speed and an automatic transmission, both you could have got with air conditioning. 383, hey DVD, hey boss. 383, four speed, automatic, didn't matter, you could get air conditioning. Now however, when you got into the 440s, you could get a 440 with an automatic transmission with H51 air conditioning. However, you could not get a 440 and a four speed transmission with air conditioning, which blows me away because I can't imagine why that would be. You could not get a 446 pack with air conditioning with either transmission, and you could never, ever get air conditioning with a 426 Hemi in any car. Part of those reasons, I think, for the six pack is the size of the air cleaner would have had an obvious interference. Yeah. Why, if you had a six pack, you would also have the multiple variable speed wiper that held flush to the cowl so that that big air cleaner wouldn't hit it. You couldn't get two speed wipers and a six pack on a car. So all very interesting, but the one that I don't understand is why you couldn't get a 444 barrel four speed with air conditioning. Huh. Yeah, that's weird, huh? Be a good question to pose to my little friend, Tony, who thinks he knows everything. <laughs> certainly knows a Philly steak sandwich. <laughs> He's not even here to defend himself. I love it. The guy's created Philly a new sandwich. employee handbook. Alyssa's been working on it. It's a very in-depth handbook. <laughs> I noticed that the first six pages pretty much cover my whole act of what I can't do. <laughs> so we're doing a rewrite, working on that. Keep you posted. Bottom line is, is our air conditioning unit is ready to go into the car. That's one of the next things we're going to do. 
However, we do have to install the drivetrain in the car so we can get it down on its wheels and tires, roll it off of the rack, then we can get the doors wide open to put this in. So that's where we're at right now on our 1971 Dodge Challenger RT formal back roof 383 automatic Gringo FJ6 car. Uh, finally got word from Larry uh, that he's going to be able to make it in today. So excited uh, to see the vinyl top actually go on this car. Uh, he finally got a free moment, so I kind of told him, you know, what we're needing uh, for this particular top because it's going to need a little bit of foam overlay around that uh, back window plug. So foam's really cool. Yeah. This is a, a closed cell foam. Yeah. And this foam, if yeah. we got up here and it's too much, we can hand sand the edge down. It doesn't absorb any moisture or nothing. No, no. And that's the same stuff the factory used, because whenever yeah. we pulled this top off the car, it had that foam still glued to that window plug. So yeah. we're just emulating what the factory did back in the day, so. Yeah. Yeah, super excited that the engine and suspension is finally going in the 71 Challenger. I know you lit a fire underneath your mic and your dad's <laughs> butt uh, to get this thing going, and lo and behold, it's here and it's ready to go in. Super excited. We're getting ready to install the eight and three quarter rear end with the 323 Sure Grip in our 71 Dodge Challenger RT 383 formal back roof car. This is a 71 E body the performance version, which all got the rear sway bar, whereas in 1970, only the AAR and the TA Challenger received the rear sway bar. Let's take the nuts off of the shackles, thusly. Somebody's gone crazy with the wrench. Okay, who has a 5.8 wrench? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely time to get the engine and suspension in. I mean, this has been rolling around on a skateboard for a minute now, so I'm, I'm glad that I could help and get this done a little bit quicker. And I'm also really excited that we all get to work together as a team. So when we put the engines in and the suspension in, we get everybody together and we all get to do it together. So that doesn't happen very often. We're usually kind of all in our own areas of the shop. The outer shackle brace bracket comes off. Take the bushing off, oh, nope, I've got, People hate grease. They put it on the outside, but they don't put it on the inside. You gotta put it on the inside. Why? Did Royal put this together? That will not lubricate anything. He hates it. God, it just makes it taking it apart so hard. You hear that squeaking? That shouldn't happen. Yeah. There should be grease in there. He hates the grease. Can we put... Some grease on it now. Would Why don't you come over here? We will once we get okay. it apart. Dry as a bone. No reason for that ever. And I don't know for sure if it was Royal or not, but it's very stupid not to do it because when you go to take it apart, it's difficult to do. And if you put it together, this will squeak on that. That's why we grease them. That's the whole motive behind it. Now these are shoved on all the way, so they're gonna squeak. I got it, you want a pair of pliers to put on them and pry them off, just to kind of grip them? It, yeah, it might not hurt. <laughs> See if you can twist it. Oh, they're sucking us on there, huh? Yeah, that's just squeezing yeah, it, dadgummit. Did you get the other ones off, Mark, or no? No. No, they need to come apart, too. So, Dave, when they asked us, asked us earlier if we foreseen any problems. Yeah, well, yeah, I, did, I should have talked to Nostradamus. Isn't he that? No, uh, Nostradamus is a big predictor, yeah. Yeah, there you go, yeah. He's predicted it all. There's certain things like this that you just can't foresee happening, you know? It's like a monkey in a football. This what does that right. even mean? Monkey a football? Oh, it's not good, whatever it is. Whoever mocked these into place just didn't grease them, so taking them apart is a And now they're all greased, we're past that point. We're ready to let the car down so we can put the shackles up into place, put the shackle brackets on, then we'll put the sway bar brackets in place on the, on the rear shock plates, and we're in, they'll be done. Flizzum, flazzum, that's pretty close on 
<laughs> Come down here more, Mark. Prism a little more, plasm, yeah. Pretty close. Them. Yep, right there. Beautiful. Listen, <laughs> plasm, sort of close. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I owe some. The uh, bushings for the shackles are a little bit tight, so we're going to grab a bigger pair of pliers so we can just kind of force them together. And as soon as that's done, we will be ready to put this bad boy down and move to the front of the car. Okay, everything's tightened down back here. It looks like they're ready to go to the front, so let's move up front. Did you get all the brake lines from uh, inline tube, by the way? Inline tube, Fantastic. yep. Just the best. I mean, they do a great they job. They fit like a glove. Perfect, yeah. Oh, I very smart. Uh, How many times you have to pull a radiator out to figure that one out? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did always it remember. every single time. Yeah, they're a pain oh. in the butt. <laughs> if you put the radiator in and you don't have this little carriage bolt in place, you gotta take the radiator back out, which means you gotta take all the coolant out of it, make a great big mess. Thing very will fight smart. you all for very a bolt. Smart. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm not getting much traction there. There, the only thing more. is. And that'll give us Have a lot a handle more. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's always nice to get a suspension in the car. Then I can get it on wheels and makes yeah, it a heck of a lot easier to work on. Do you have one of your bolts in, Mark? Okay, so we've got the transmission cross member in place. Uh, front engine mounts to the K member are in place. So we're just gonna raise it up and bolt in the rest of the hardware. It'll be rolling this afternoon, no doubt about it. All right, head on up, baby. Here's why the ghouls will live to cash another paycheck. Dave and Alyssa got the fuel and brake lines installed on Buck's Green Go 1971 Challenger RT. That wasn't too bad. No, that didn't fight us at all. Alyssa helped Mike get the Challenger's 383 engine fired up and ready to install. Mark showed us the correct use of plastic filler and busted the myth that Bondo means bad body work. Dave and Alyssa got the headliner and the very unique overhead consolette installed in the 1971 Challenger RT. Just in time for the ghouls to gang up and install the drivetrain. So now, Buck's Challenger RT can hit the road and track on its own four wheels. One of the things that the owner hasn't made his mind up on yet is the wheel and tire combination. I had bought the 15 sevens that the car started life with. They were a painted wheel with a dog dish center cap. He said, no, I want Krager five spokes, the Krager SS, the retro style wheel. I happen to have a set of used ones that I had bought off a of Craigslist a while back. My guess is everything that's on that pallet, he's gonna wanna go one size up on. But we're gonna put it on right now, let it down, put it under its own weight, roll it back and forth, get the car to settle, and find out if that's gonna be the right size. Let's stink it and drink it. Just take, just 13, take her down 16. a notch. Just take her down a notch. 1360. Take her down a notch. 1360. Oh, I've hurt Mike's feelings and he's lashing out. Now, you folks, got, you got lug let's nutters? all give him a group hug. Let me grab my nuts. You got lug nutters, <laughs> boss? <laughs> like, right here? They're nostalgic. I mean, this is what everybody ran back in the late cool. 70s, 80s. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take pictures of this. I'm gonna call the owner of the car and say, now for sure, is this the wheel and tire you want me to spend your money on? If he says, yeah, that's it, I'll take a look at the tire sizes, reorder the brand new wheels with the correct offset and the correct size. I'll send those off and check in and see how we're doing. 